When I first started the grizzly bear work um, um, on the East Front of the Mountains uh, here in Montana, um, grizzly bears hadn't gone out on the Great Plains for about 50 years. They, they were not tolerated. Uh, if they went out there, they were killed. And the ones that weren't killed learned not to go out there. Um, it was a, a just a layover thing of when when bears and wolves and all those kinds of animals were bad. Uh, they were bad for agriculture, especially the stockmen and, and uh, uh, various types. Um, uh, lumber people, um, they all wanted the bears dead. And there was, uh, you know, continent-wide sentiment, both in Canada and the U.S., to kill those kinds of animals because they... They interfered with the good animals, and they interfered with agricultural interests. Of course, of course, both countries were, you know, we were agricultural base at that time, and everybody talked in terms of agriculture. And um, this hung over clear into the mid 1900s in um, in Montana, and the attitude was essentially still that way along the East Front. Uh, bears were bad; they weren't allowed out there, and um, with the Endangered Species Act and with the research, you know, we started talking to people and uh, and uh, teaching people things about bears and finding out things about bears. And uh, gradually the attitude changed, and now um, a good lot of the people uh, think it's great that grizzly bears go out 30, 40 miles out onto the plains from, from the mountains. and. Uh, and this has happened just literally in about 15 years, this change in attitude. And, and the bears learned it very quickly. Um, they, they found out they don't get shot. They go out there. And so they now go way out past Shoto and out past Augusta and places like that. There were, there were bears all, all over the plains, way out in the plains. Um, but they were pretty much along the rivers. People think they were spread evenly on the plains, and that's the way the maps uh, show it that they were, you know, spread out all over the plains, but they were along the rivers and the draws and the creek bottoms, and such. And uh, they were primarily there actually for the uh, for the berries, the the um, prairie buffalo berry, the uh, choke cherries, and uh, kinnick all those sorts of things. Um, a lot of times there was better production out there, or maybe on a bad year in the mountains they were better out there, and uh, they, it was an alternative for them. There were also, of course, the, the buffalo migrations and the buffalo uh, jumps and, uh, and such, and they, they took advantage of that as well. But uh, I think they were primarily out there for the vegetation. Um, we get the idea from Lewis and Clark and other early accounts that there were just tons of grizzly bears out on the, on the Great Plains, but I don't think they were. I think there were tons of them along the, uh, the streams. Of course, in those days, they didn't have I-90 and I-94 and such. You traveled on the river, so you were literally traveling all day, every day, right through the the pantry for the uh, for the bears. And uh, of course, they had a lot of encounters. Had they been on the high ground out in the middle of the prairie, you know, traveling, I don't think they would have had nearly the trouble. But um, it, you know, it was impossible. They had to stick with the water to keep track of where they were. Um, but also for all the resources along the streams. Um, another thing that bothers me about um, those accounts and the, and the status of the bears now, you a lot of times read in books that uh, the grizzly bears were driven from the Great Plains or they were driven from the big valleys um, into the mountains for their sanctuary. Well, that's not what happened. What happened, of course, was the ones who lived out there were killed and the ones that were in the mountains uh, survived. And Montana has had, uh, right up to the worst of times for the, for the grizzly bears, Montana kept a pretty good grizzly bear population. And it wasn't that we loved grizzly bears more than people in other states. Uh, it's just that our mountains are so wide. You know, they're 200 miles wide, the Rockies are in this area, and they're very rugged. And we tried to kill them all, and we couldn't. We just didn't get to it, you know. We were well on the way by the 1950s um, with the new poisons and such uh, to killing them all, but uh, 
it was about that time that people started questioning whether that was really right that we kill them all. So, in effect, we ended up with grizzly bears when hardly anybody else had them um, um, because we just <laughs> weren't capable of killing them all, uh, which was lucky for the grizzly bears. So, and, and I think lucky for us now too when you look back. Well, Lewis and Clark had a different kind of experience, I think, with bears. Uh, I think you have to remember the times um, and the place. They were coming all day, every day, through the bear's pantry. They were going by buffalo jumps. They were going by log jams that had carcasses of buffalo washed in from the, from the spring thaw. And the bears were concentrated along those. And, of course, they will defend their food, just like, you know, we will protect our home and our, our vehicle, our artillery. So there they were coming, you know, upriver, um, right up to their neck in, in, in grizzly bears. And these were bears that had dealt with, you know, with native people. I think they had their way with native people in a lot of cases because the people, they didn't have good weapons. And uh, if the bear wanted to take your uh, meat cache or, or whatever, you know, Unless you were well prepared, you were better to get out of the bear's way and uh, welcome to my food, brother, um, that sort of an approach. Well, here were bears then that um, it was their home, it was their food cache, their young were right nearby, and the people they dealt with in the past were were pretty much a pushover. And, um, and um, this was the, the situation they were up against. And... Uh, I think that, even so, I don't think the bears were exploiting Lewis and Clark so much as they were they were defending their food, they were defending their hunting area or whatever, or defending the area where their young were. And um, so day after day, that's what they were walking into. Every day they'd walk into somebody else's, some other bear's uh, food cache, or they were walking into some other bear's uh, place where she had her young. And... Um, I think it um, it was to be expected that would happen, and of course they were going by buffalo jumps. Where I'm sure the bear, just like just like um, when we had uh, boneyards east of the mountains, um, where ranchers took all the dead livestock in the spring out to the boneyard. Well, these were 100 years old, and bears would come from up to 100 miles to those boneyards. They knew where the boneyard was. They knew when there was meat there, and uh, Plus, they could smell it probably from 10 miles away. I'm sure they did the same thing with buffalo jumps. I'm sure they did the same thing with um, with log jams. They knew where there'd be food. And so the humans were, you know, they had to travel on the water. Um, and the water was where all the bears were. And, uh, and they, of course, had an agenda. They had to move on upstream. So and they literally had to fight bears uh, at times going upstream. Um, the whole prairie was not like that, and I'd like to re-emphasize that. It just that, that was the highway, and it was the bear's kitchen and storeroom, and, uh, and it was inevitable they had a lot of trouble with grizzly bears, and um, it doesn't surprise me at all. It wouldn't be the case now, you know, you could still use that river, and a lot of people do, it's very enjoyable, but I think it was a pretty scary thing when they went down through there. Management of wildlife is pretty much a North American creation, uh, um, at least on a huge scale that we, we do. Um, and it was keyed by, to sportsmanship, and, you know, and here we, the common people had access to wildlife, and, and, uh, we wanted to keep it that way, and so we invented management, we invented laws, and uh, eventually wildlife research and, and such. We couldn't do much in terms of management with, with bears ex except, you know, kill them all and hope you got the right one. And it's not that long ago that people did that. I remember um, when I first started working on, on, um, on bears, um, Glacier Park had a bear incident. They call the animal damage control people. They came in and killed seven bears. And they said, well, we think we got the right one. Park Service said, thank you. And they said, well, call us again if you got another problem. That's the way things were done right up into the, into the 60s, actually. Um, well, that was poor management. That was, you know, we, 
But we didn't know enough about bears. Uh, you couldn't do research on bears. We were doing a lot of management on deer and rough grouse and things. We had databases uh, for management and all that. But it was impossible, literally, to, to work with bears until the invention of the dart gun and the quick-acting drugs, which was in the late 50s. And, uh, and all of a sudden, then, we could, we could build databases on bears. And, and also, there was, it, it coincided with the, with the um, changing attitudes uh, towards bears that people start, started to have. And so people wanted data and would fund research. And as the data came in, uh, the management improved. Um, and sure, they're such an intractable animal. How are you going to manage them? Well, you do it with the habitat. You do it with um, road closures. You do it with... Uh, with teaching the public about, you know, uh, stay away from kill areas, as there could be a bear defending it, and uh, and teaching people about bear behavior. Um, they give them a chance, you know, they're trying to live with us. Uh, just don't kill them every time you see them. It took a while for that to soak in, but, um, but people, I think, pretty much have that attitude now. And... Um, We've gotten even to the fine points, if you know, in terms of productivity and all that. Bears are a tough ma animal to manage because they, um, well, there's a fear factor. There's um, there's a conflict of interest. There's people who hate them and just plain want them dead. There's other people who think they're the symbol of wilderness and want everyone saved. There's others who want a trophy on the wall, you know, above all else. Well, how do you meet all those demands? So it's hard from that standpoint. They're also difficult to manage because they're a very expensive animal to manage. And this is one problem Montana has had, is um, doing, doing the research is very expensive and doing the management is very expensive. We're not a rich state. We've got most of the grizzly bears. And we literally can't afford to do what needs to be done for the nation. So with the endangered species listing as threatened, see, that, that allowed federal money to come in. And that was partly on purpose done that way to allow federal money to come in and help for, with the management and help with the, with the research because the state just couldn't, couldn't handle it. I mean, we couldn't afford to manage grizzly bears and do research that the nation needed. Um, there had never been much talk about that, but that's what was, was going on. You know, it was, We had to get some federal money involved, even though it comes with all sorts of uh, um, uh, baggage. We had to have federal money involved in order to do the things that need to be done for the bears because every single thing you do costs thousands of dollars. You can't even look at uh, grizzly bear research without at least 100000 a year for multiple years because they live a long time. You know, There's bears that live in the wild over 30 years. Well, if you're going to find out about a whole species, you've got to keep the study going a long time. Who's going to pay the bills? But... Um, with extrapolations from other bears and other species and the databases we have, there have been some pretty careful management uh, uh, installed that um, takes pretty good care of, of, of the bears, I think. Um, some people say management, you're interfering with nature. Well, uh, you know, it's true. But, you know, of course, we've interfered with nature so much for so long that we've got to do some things to help nature do what nature needs to do. And, and a lot of management is literally keyed to letting nature be nature. Uh, um, she can kick our tail around yet, but she also needs help from people. Mother Nature isn't, uh, doesn't run anything, everything anymore. The present day grizzly is still the grizzly. I think, you know, uh, Animals evolve, but they evolve very, very slowly. There's been, I think, no genetic change. Even the, what we call the, um, the, um, the plains grizzly and the barren ground grizzly were just grizzly bears that lived out there genetically. They, behaviorally, they learned things differently, and they did things differently. I think what we've got today is exactly the same grizzly bear that Lewis and Clark encountered genetically, I, but I think um, behaviorally we've got a, a somewhat different animal. I think, you know, they've learned about <laughs> Gary Larson uh, cartoon. Uh, they've learned what a rifle is and, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, I think in many cases they hear an engine from a truck or a vehicle 
they've had bad experiences or they've watched other animals, other bears or elk or something run when uh, they hear an engine uh, coming. And um, so they move away from exposed areas. Um, we don't see them because they heard us coming and, and they, they, that relates to bad experience either for them or some other animal and they move out and we don't see them. So behavioral, I think um, they've learned to be shyer from us um, than they were in Lewis and Clark day. Um, I think they have probably quite a bit more respect for the two-legged bear, um, which is fine, you know, that's the way they should respond to us. Um, and I think it's what we require from them, that they, that they don't push it. They, they find a way out, they back out. Well, there's always the occasional grizzly around yet that, that won't do that. But uh, I think partly uh, um, we haven't done the research that's necessary in that area of behavior. I think bears are capable of um, altering their relationship with us even further. There are few people out there who are doing research of that nature now where they walk around out in the woods with wild bears the bear gets used to them, accepts them as, an, as another bear that's not competing with them, and uh, uh, seem to appreciate the company. Well, that kind of research scares me because a lot of people misinterpret it and go out there too soon with too little information. I think people doing that research must be extremely careful. I think someday we're going to have a, a much better uh, relationship with bears and be able to live with them more compatibly. But uh, if people go too far too fast and without adequate information, it actually can work against that. But I, I see some glimmers of um, a promise out there that we will do that kind of research, that we will have a, a different relationship with bears, more like the, the coastal bears have with other bears, where, you know, hey, sa there's salmon to be caught, you know, let's not argue. and. Uh, I, I think we're going to go that way with bears. And something about human beings, we like to do that. We did it with songbirds. Long, we used to eat songbirds, and then we gave them special status. Then we did it with uh, things like whales. And um, I think we're going to do it with things like wolves and bears, too. We're going to give them a special status. I think we're going that way. I'm not sure just where it'll lead. But it's very interesting. I think that that might happen. Well, it's the Selway, Selway Bitterroot area is, uh, is kind of unique and different when it comes to bears. It is bear habitat, but it's granitic, um, so there are huge areas of just rock. Um, there are, the soils aren't as rich as limestone soils would be, so I, I don't think it's as productive, in, at least in some bear foods. Um, but another thing about the Bitterroots, they used to have salmon runs on the west side, and they used to have the Bitterroot Valley on, on the east side of the Bitterroots. And uh, I don't know about w with when Lewis and Clark came through, I'm sure there were bears used the Bitterroot a great deal, but maybe not at the time of the year that they were in the Bitterroot. I don't know how many days they spent in the Bitterroot, but you look at probably a couple weeks each way. And if it was the wrong time of the year, you're not going to see many bears. If you come through in the winter, you wouldn't see any. Um, but certainly the bears used the bitterroot, and, uh, you know, right up into the 30s and uh, even the early 40s, there were grizzlies who came into, um, into Missoula on a rattlesnake, by rattlesnake school, and uh, out by the meatpacking plant, uh, out by reserve. Uh, where grizzlies came down out of the bitterroots and out of the uh, rattlesnakes to feed on, uh, on carrion. Um, another thing about the Metaroots is it's been burned terribly in the fires early in the century. So early in this century and on in the 20s and the 30s, that was sheep country. There were very few trees in the Metaroots. It was grassland and there were sheep all over the Metaroots. And I think the bear did quite well then. But you know, in those days it wasn't just sheep herder. It was a sheep herder and a kid with a rifle. It was with the sheep. And the kid with a rifle shot bears and wolves and coyotes and other vermin. Um, so it, it was quite a different world then. 
I think in terms of today, I think it still is grizzly bear habitat. It's not as good as Glacier Park, uh, Whitefish Range, um, or areas on up in BC uh, and Alberta. But um, nonetheless, it could have some grizzly bears. Uh, they won't have salmon to feed on. They won't have the Beirut Valley to use. Um, there will be some problems, I think, until they learn you can't go down and eat apples in the Bitterroot Valley and, um, and stuff. But they will learn that. If you, it takes time. It might take a generation or two. With something like augmentation or reintroduction with wolves and bears, you've got, you've got to give them time. They've got to learn how to use an area. They've got to learn the do's and the don'ts of an area. And, and it took... Uh, it took several generations to eliminate them from areas. It's going to take them several generations probably to learn how to use an area again. So I think it can happen in the bitter roots. I don't think there will ever be a high density of them. There needs to be more research. I'm, I'm quite upset the way the whole thing has gone. There's a whole list of research topics that weren't dealt with that should be, um, such as the soil type and the, and the, the plant foods that... Uh, are there or aren't there? That should be documented. What are the black bears going to think of that? You know, uh, it's plumb full of black bears right now. And uh, if you take sub-adult grizzly bears and put them into a dense population of black bears, uh, the big black bears are going to kill the little grizzlies. So, I think we need a database on on that. We need connecting corridors. Um, we need to know what they are, and where they are, and make sure the corridors are there. So there's, in my mind, there's a lot of research that should have been done, uh, a lot on public attitudes for people in the Bitterroot and for potato farmers over on the other side of the mountains. Um, sure, they're going to be afraid of grizzly bears. If there's none there and you say, I'm going to bring some in, they're going to be afraid. And you have to deal with that in terms of research and in terms of programs, and that wasn't done.